I have to be able to bring alumni back because you realize that uh, it really becomes your faith in education, uh, which is to say that as students, you can become incredibly successful when you leave here, regardless of all of our best efforts to the contrary. Uh, seriously, if you think things are wild now, you should have been here then. And I am convinced that what we put Maurice and his classmates through uh, definitely contributed uh, to an aesthetic that is easy and pragmatic after the confusion that was foisted upon him. Um, before coming to Chicago to get his mark in 91, Maurice received his BA from Williams College, where he was classmates with uh, his two current partners at Blue Dot. Uh, Maurice has served as the COO of Blue Dot uh, since 1996, and he left his architectural practice in Chicago and headed to Minneapolis, but a very much married to Marlowe. Um, I know, you guys are all <laughs> Maybe we weren't that. Um, so all the occupying the territory, you could say, between design and reach and Ikea, I think this is uh, their strategy. Um, Blue Dot's products have received numerous design awards, uh, are held in the collections of major museums, and most importantly, have found their way into the lifestyle of the growing public with an approach that is at once pragmatic and witty. Or as one of Blue Dot, Blue, Blue Dot's taglines recently said, uh, safe and boring doesn't have to be safe and boring. Um, after all, who wouldn't want a Barbarella coffee table and a felt up chair? Uh, I do. Um, I will negotiate with Maurice afterwards. Um, please join me in welcoming back to this room of many reviews, uh, his treasure return, Maurice Blanks. So affordability was about the product. 
Uh, what we saw at the time, modern design was very, very expensive. Uh, $8,000 for a lounge, $600 for a coffee table or a chair. It just seemed it was very expensive and we thought we knew a little something about making things and we thought we could do it better or cheaper. Um, to make it more available, so this is about the distribution. At the time, when we started looking for furniture, if you wanted modern design, you had to go to the merchandise mart and you had to have a secret handshake and go with your architect or your designer and they would take you to the showroom because the public wasn't allowed in the design mart. Uh, so if you wanted to buy something, you had to kind of be in the club and certainly if you wanted to see something, uh, you were basically looking at magazines and books. There was no way to find this design. Approachability is about the brand and about the uh, the idea that what we saw at that time was uh, was very elitist. It felt that it was not welcome, or everyone was not welcome in the sort of modern design camp. It was really uh, kind of rarefied air. And so we set out to make a brand that was more uh, more humble and more authentic and more approachable. So let's start with the product. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about our design process. And, uh, but I do want to say right off the bat that design happens everywhere in our company. It's not just happening in the design studio, it's not just happening with the product, but it's happening throughout everything we do. When we started the company, one of the things that we said was that we wanted to design the company as carefully as we designed all the products. So, to get to the price points that we wanted to get to, to make the product more affordable, and this is not to say cheap. You know, we didn't want to be at the sort of Ikea price point. We wanted to be at a price point that was well below what we saw this sort of high and modern European design at. Uh, we wanted to be not, not necessarily kind of old baby and not Prada, but we wanted it to be sort of J. Crew. was kind of how we thought about it. Although J. Crew, I don't know if it was a brand at the time, but. Um, so efficiency would be incredibly important. So we had to be really thoughtful about how we designed. We had to know a lot about materials. We had to know a lot about manufacturing. And the design process for us is actually similar to an architectural problem in a way. And maybe that's because two of the founders are architects. But we looked at the process of designing furniture as kind of a big multivariable equation. And those, the, the variables in the equation would be things like uh, material yield and machining and packaging uh, and assembly. And all those different variables had to be solved in a way that satisfied the whole equation. Right? You couldn't satisfy one of those variables and, and disregard the other variables. So it was this kind of big, long equation, and again, not unlike an architectural design process, in that there are so many different competing concerns and systems in a building, and all of them have to be solved in a way that's at least satisfactory. Right? You may suppress certain systems, but they all have to work. Uh, so we saw our process as solving all these variables, and then the product was kind of a residue that was the result of that process. So the good news is that we were inspired by constraints, because there were a lot of constraints. This is one of our first products, and it's the Chicago 8 box, which I saw, uh, it was only displayed up in the office. Thank you. Um, and this used the materials and the methods that we knew at the time really well. So it was really uh, simple boxes, uh, and those were ready to assemble, so the boxes came flat packed, you put them together, and then you slid them over these powder coated steel tubes. So we started with the material and the yield of the material and tried to get to 100% yield on the, on the uh, sheets of material and ultimately designed it in such a way that we, we set the tops and the sides of the boxes into different panels and got to the point where we were really just left with sawdust when we were finished machining the panels. We also employed a little strategy that we, linked, that we named later the smart parts uh, and that's the idea of, of essentially modules. And the reason that was helpful for us is because in the early days we had no customers, really, and we had really no sales. Um, so we didn't want a ton of inventory, but when you go to a fabricator and you say, yeah, I just need six of these, um, and it means that they have to set up their CNC and they have to get everything ready in their shop, it's not, um, let's just say they're not willing to do it. So with smart parts, we were allowed, we, were, we enabled ourselves to go into a facility and say, I want 80 of these boxes, make 80 of these boxes for me. Uh, but then we just came away with 10 products because there are eight boxes in every product. So it was a way for us to sort of get in the door of a larger manufacturer 
but still allow some efficiency and burn the door down. So this is not a blue nut product, <laughs> but it, it, uh, it exemplifies, uh, I guess, a strategy that we employ a lot, which is not reinventing the wheel. If you're trying to make something efficient, affordable, it typically uh, doesn't involve paradigms and, and materials and machinery that is not sort of invented yet or it's not, it's not in wide use. So in this case, we took the idea of the sort of block and, and shelf, bookshelf that, that I think half of my friends probably have in their own room at the time, and tried to reapply that into a piece of furniture that would be appropriate for us. So this was our first attempt, which we called Weave, which was um, actually a total failure. And it failed for a couple of different reasons, but I think it's interesting to show this uh, to walk through some of the reasons that we would reject a product. So we liked aesthetically how this looked. We liked how the, the blocks, so in this case the cement blocks are bent plywood U-shapes, and the shelves are honeycomb, uh, hollow core, thick uh, painted wood shelves. So we really liked how it was this interplay between the horizontal and the blocks and the way it weaved. And, uh, what ended up happening though is we ended up with all these weird spaces that were really not functional at all. People couldn't figure out how they needed something that was like this tall, but this wide, or little tiny spaces. So functionally, we started to realize as we developed it that it wasn't uh, very functional. And it also was really hard to make because the bent plywood, when it comes back out of the mold, it tends to dry and cool and twist. And so the whole thing ended up as like this kind of shaky house of cards. So we, we, we went back to the drawing board because we thought the original design idea, the block and plank strategy, was actually a good strategy. So we took another swing at it, and this time we did a steel shelf with a miter folded wood block. So in this case, there's a three piece, a, a three part uh, block that sort of folds together to create the, the, the structure. Uh, we eventually moved away from the wood block into the steel shelves, uh, which you see here. And so this is the final product. This is the product that's in production, uh, and this is called Shilf, which is a shelf. Up let me just move to the next slide here. Um, and this is a uh, this is this is an addition of wood doors so that we could uh, we could have some closed storage and adding a little bit of warmth to the otherwise powder coated steel. Also, in the vein of not reinventing the wheel is a product or a line of products that was actually inspired by a late night design session in a pizza box. We were trying to figure out a way to make a simple line of accessories. And so we began to explore the idea of perforating and folding material, which is what we saw here. So this is essentially a flat pack box. But we knew we couldn't use cardboard, but we thought about it, but we couldn't figure out how to do it. So we eventually moved into laser cutting and perforating steel and then powder coating it. And what was great about this was that it, uh, it was a really simple process. Buy sheet steel, we'd send it to a laser cutter, they would laser cut it, we'd send it to the power coder, they would send it to us, we'd pack it, and it would go to the customer, and then the customer would fold it in three dimensions. So the name of this line is called 2D3D uh, because it's two dimensional when you get it, and it's three dimensional after you put it together. So really efficient, uh, no returns, no product defects, it was bulletproof. So, Again, not reinventing the wheel, extending the success of that, we thought, well, couldn't we make a chair that uses the same, the same technology? So a 2D, 3D chair. So we began to explore the idea of perforating steel, powder coating it, and then letting the customer bend it up into a chair. And the goal was to get the chair in this, ironically or coincidentally, I guess, back in the pizza box, right? So to, to, to make the chair so that it fit into, uh, into a drape rolled plastic uh, insert that would allow it to pack in about two inches. So really efficient, uh, really efficient to store, really efficient to transport, and fairly simple assembly by the customer. Uh, these are a couple of early designs, and we were just playing with the, the different form and the way this would fold and how it would, how structurally it would pull together. Uh, one of the nice things about the powder coated, the laser cut powder coated steel is that it was, it was inexpensive and easy to prototype. 
So unlike, say, injection molded plastic, which would require a $200,000 tool, we could send this out, have a laser cut, have a powder coat, and bring it back to the shop and put it together. So we could go through lots of iterations. And really the only big technical challenge with the 2D 3D technology was getting the right specification on the powder coat so that when the perforated panel is folded, the powder coat doesn't crack. But other than that, it was, it was as we said, bulletproof technology. So this is the final, the final family of real good chairs. And it's named after, some people think that it's sort of a, an arrogant, uh, self-important name, but it's actually after, there's a Minnesota expression that's real good, that's sort of like, okay, or how are you? It's, it's kind of like aloha in Hawaiian, it means a lot of different things, it's very colloquial, and people with good Minnesota accents say it really well. So that's where the name came from. We did another extension of this line, and we did a powder coated, or sorry, we did a raw copper plated version. And uh, the interest for us here was to do something that was not, that was less kind of uh, processed and, and, uh, and a little more uh, warm in a way that had the, the, the way the copper patinas over time is just very different than the way white powder coat looks. Uh, it drove the price up dramatically. The original real good chair, when, when we first introduced it, it was $99. And uh, the copper chair, I think, is $299 maybe because the copper is so expensive. But now this is the number one selling real good chair. And then kind of the last slide on the real good chair, or on the 2D, 3D technology was uh, a few years ago we were asked by the New York Times to create a T for their T magazine, which is sort of the, their design magazine. And uh, we had an intern at the time, and uh, the intern spent about four days trying to figure out how to make this thing, uh, how to let the flat piece of steel look like. So this was the, the cover of the New York Times magazine. So the real good chair was not, in fact, our first chair. This was the first chair we ever made. And it was called the felt up chair. And the name uh, was innocent at the time because the intern, you can see there's a nylon sling on the back and a felt sling on the top. So that's two separate slings that are lying together. And we, we wanted it to be felt, but felt because it's basically a compressed material. It's not woven. Uh, it stretches over time. So if you did this without the nylon, then you would eventually be sitting on the floor. So we had that nylon, and an intern uh, assembled the prototype, and, and they put the, the, the nylon up. So somebody put a post-it on it and said, felt up. We thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> but in fact, it was, this was really uncomfortable, this chair. <laughs> it looked really nice. Uh, it looked great in photographs. It was just a simple bent tube uh, that came in a few different parts, and then you put the sling over it, so it was really efficient but it was super uncomfortable. You were kind of lying back like you were at the dentist's office and, and then there was a bar that just digging into your back. <laughs> so I, I uh, it got to the point where I would no longer call it a chair in the, in, the, in the office because I felt like a chair, I felt like that word had a certain nobility to it, that it was a certain requirement for comfort, uh, a certain level threshold of comfort to be called a chair. So I called it the device for keeping your body off the ground. <laughs> so if somebody came to the showroom, I would say, you know, this is the big box over here, or this is the yoga chair, and this is the device for keeping your body off the ground. Instead. So after we did this, uh, after we, we did the device and we realized we had failed in some way, uh, we kind of doubled down and decided that it was really important for us to do a chair that would be comfortable. And so we designed this chair, which ultimately became called the Buttercup Chair. And it was just important that it was comfortable. That was kind of our first goal, was to, just to prove to ourselves that we could do that. But we felt that that was an important threshold as a design team to be able to design a comfortable chair. Uh, so we started with the idea of that plywood because uh, that plywood is very inexpensive to tool. You can do a, a tool for five to ten thousand dollars, as again opposed to something like injection molded plastic, which is going to cost a hundred to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we started making models or sort of samples and uh, looking at different forms and cardboard and, uh, and uh, different materials before we moved into the actual tooling process. Uh, we used foam core. We used, you can see in the middle there, there's one that's it's scored foam core. 
And that was that ended up being something that was important. That material and, that, and that the way we made that that um, that study was important because you can't bend plywood in two dimensions or in three dimensions. You can only build it, build, bend it in two. So you can only bend scored foam board in two dimensions. You can't bend it in three. So it was a good test for us to make sure that before we went to the trouble of making a tool or a mold, that we could actually make that shape in the mold. Because if you try to bend plywood in three dimensions, well, now they have technology. There's, there's, you can do it, I should say. But for what we were doing with the price point, we had to be out. We couldn't do it. Um, so we could sort of prove our designs out before we went through the process of actually making it. Um, this, is, uh, this was a, what we call a seating buck, which is really a, uh, just a bunch of materials kind of stacked together to try to get the feel of the chair, to try to understand what the angles, what, how deep is the seat, how high are the arms, uh, what's the pitch of the back, trying to sort all that out, again, in the interest of trying to make it, it comfortable. There's a little bit of the shape that you'll see ultimately in the final chair here, but really what we're focused on is just trying to understand the comfort and the pitch, and a little sharp now. <laughs> so then we made a, a prototype in our shop. This is a, a, a rigid insulation mold that we made, just cut it in the shop with a bandsaw, and then we put it in a vacuum bag, and uh, put a bunch of pieces of veneer, glue, put glue between them, and put it in here. And that's how we did the original prototypes. So this is one of those early prototypes. Uh, the biggest challenge was connecting the back. It's a two-part piece, a two-part chair. So the, the back is a part and the seat is a part. And the connection, you can see some pieces of tape there. That was really where we spent a lot of time trying to make that joint um, a mechanical joint so that it would stay together when you put, when you put pressure on the back. Uh, after we got the basic idea of the shell and how it was going to be trimmed, we started looking at the base. So here's another another iteration of the base. We probably looked at a hundred different bases. Um, we finally got to the point where we were going into production. We did the final drawings, figured out the final trim for the shell, and moved into production. So we bought, we paid for the tool. This is the mold in, in, the, in the press. Uh, the metal pieces that you see on the lining the mold transmit a high frequency vibration that cures the glue that will go into the, into the veneer parts. So the glue won't set up while you're trying to get everything together. It'll only set up once it's in the mold. <clears throat> so here you see a bunch of sheets of veneer. So it's birch veneer. And each sheet is run through a roller that just has glue on it. And the top and the bottom are just glued on one side. And they'll, they'll kind of put this big bulky sandwich in the tool. And then watch your fingers. <laughs> And then it stays in there for about 90 seconds, and then it comes out. Then the part, it, it's cooled, and then it's taken to another facility where it's cut on a five-axis CNC router. So the trim of that part is done uh, elsewhere. And so here's the final product with the final base. And I think one of the things that I like about this chair is the way that the kind of the front and the back play, and the, really the back of the chair is, in my mind, kind of the front elevation. I think it's the most interesting part. And it, and he talk, sort of talks most about the process. Uh, I don't know, a handful of years ago, we were in a show at MCA called uh, Universal Experience, I think is what it was called. And Francesco Bonami, who was the curator, wanted to use the buttercup chair. So this is a shot of the MCA uh, with our chair in it. Here's the other shot. And I thought it was appropriate because the show was about travel and, and globalism and ubiquity. And this chair is actually made, uh, we used a Danish furniture engineer, bed plywood engineer that we hired to help us. Um, we made it in a, we made a shell, a wood part, in a factory in Poland. So it was designed in the US, worked on by a Danish guy, made it in a Polish factory, and then the base was made in Taiwan. So I said to Francesco, I said, he didn't even know this, but I said, it would be really the appropriate chair for your show. <clears throat> so I'll show you one more chair. This is, uh, a chair that is, I guess it's about two or three years old now, and it's called Hot Mesh. And it was, um, it was designed to be a well-priced outdoor chair. Uh, it was introduced at $99. And we started looking at uh, forms through history that were, that had a really efficient structure. 
And we kept coming back to the Thonia chair because it, it, uh, it was really about this frame and then there was some infill, but not a lot of infill. And, and that's where we were getting the cost. Uh, we had to do the frame because it had to hold the body up and had to support your back. <clears throat> but the infill is kind of optional. So we tried, to, we tried to minimize the infill as much as we could. Um, just playing with some early ideas of what the chair might look like. Then moving into three dimensions, this is this is this is actually a seating bunk. The back is functional, but the legs are not. So the legs are just decorative here, and the, the MDF buck is what actually holds your body up when you're on it. So then we started looking. Once we had the frame figured out, we started looking at the infill, and we wanted to do something that was maybe a little, again, less kind of manufactured, and maybe a little warmer. And we looked at weaving. We looked at weaving hemp, and we looked at weaving leather. And we couldn't really get to the, to the, it just didn't work with our frame, and we couldn't use the price point we wanted to get to. So we started to look at, at different metals. This in, infill here doesn't read very well on this image, but it's a perforated steel. It's pretty small perforations in a, in a bigger field. Looked at a lot of different perfs, and ultimately decided that it was just too typical, too kind of expected to use perforated. We looked at expanded. Metals and again, it just felt too a little bit too hardware store. And we ultimately decided to go with a custom perf that we made. And it was expensive. Uh, it was expensive to set it up because we had to pay for a tool that stamped this pattern. Uh, quite a big tool uh, that stamped this pattern. But it, it, that upfront cost uh, was now amortized over the life of all these chairs. And this is an example of a product that. Is, I guess I, I think of it as sort of if if our design principles is my wife that this was kind of an affair. Like this, was, this is where we completely abandoned our, our design principles, I think, um, and kind of fell in love with the wrong this thing. This is called Sun Bench, and the brief was a bench for a, uh, an entryway or a foot of a bed, and it started here in a cardboard model, which um, is three different hoops that are just arranged in different, uh, and welded together up here. It's, they're welded together in a form that makes those three modules look a lot more complicated than they are. So then once we, uh, once we came up with a form, and again, this wasn't efficient because you had to, they had to cut all these bands, and they had to bend them, and they had to weld them all together, they had to grind them. So it, was, it wasn't a very efficient thing to make. And then once we, once we had the raw metal part, we had then to finish it in some way. So we looked at a variety of different kind of toppings. And this was painted with, with some felt on it. And we ultimately ended up with um, this lovely process, which is rubber dipping. So you're probably most familiar with rubber dipping from pliers or playground equipment. And so we found a, uh, somebody who did playground equipment. And we said, this is, what, this is the Pantone color we want. And the guy said, well, that's great, but I have to clean the, I have to empty this tank and clean it and then put that color in there. So it's going to be really, this is the price. And he said, okay, black's great, let's do black. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would call us every once in a while. He would say, yeah, I'm doing a playground, I've got this four screen in here now. And we would send a little part, we'd send it back, and we'd look at it and say, all right, black's fine, let's just keep the little black. <laughs> so this is the dipping it uh, in the tank. And then the final bottle, which kind of, the, the, I guess we like the rubber dipping because it maintained the kind of frozen liquid look. So, <clears throat> moving away from product for a second. So, it's, this is the second idea of, of distribution of making the product accessible. So, you can make all the product you want, it can be a great price point, but if nobody can get it, and nobody can see it, then our feeling was what's the So this is really about distribution and how do we get our product into the world and how do we get it into the world into, into the world in a way that's sort of easier and broader than the design mart experience that we encountered. So we sell our products now through a few different channels, one of which is the first channel that we went into when we first started the company, which is the wholesale channel. So that, I, that is making product, putting it in our warehouse, and then selling it to independent retailers around the country then sell it to the end user. And that was great, but it was limited by the network of what were mostly mom and pop 
uh, independent stores across the country. So the first least expensive way for us to get into distribution ourselves was through the web. And the reason we had some confidence that there was a demand for, that was a, that people would want our product was that we did sell a couple of products in Design Open Reach when they first kind of made a big push in the late 90s. And with one or two products, we sold through Design Open Reach almost as much as we sold through the rest of our whole company. So we realized that they were accessing a customer base that we weren't accessing through our own our own retailers. So the first step was to do our website, um, which we started as a, um, it was actually not a real e-commerce site. If you ordered something on the website, you would send an email to somebody at customer service and they would call you back. Uh, and then about three years ago, we re-platformed to a real e-commerce site. So this is a, an example of that. And it's not just about selling the product, but it's also about branding. I'm sleeping in now with 85% less guilt. And this one I can't do. You better get a velvet rope because your living room just got a VIP section. <laughs> and now we do about 25% of our sales through our web, through our own website. So the other bigger step is opening our own retail stores and going into bricks and mortar. And this was a store in New York that we opened in uh, 2008. We opened the store. And coincidentally, this was uh, this was a store. This design was existing. We basically just moved in and painted it. And it was designed by uh, a designer in New York named Nick Dine, whose father is Jim Dine, who's a famous artist. So we literally moved in. I think it cost fifty thousand dollars to suit this out. Then we opened Los Angeles in two thousand and ten on Melrose. And a very different space, more, more sure, I guess typical of Los Angeles and some of the boat trust buildings that are there. And the next one was San Francisco. This is what was there. And this was an opportunity for me to get back kind of deeply into architecture and design because we knew that this wasn't ran right. Um, even if I mean, the color scheme is one thing, but even just the design of it was, was not right. And uh, there were a lot of problems with the facade, just functionally, and there were some exiting issues. So we uh, redid the whole facade, basically redesigned the whole building. And we did a powder-coated steel screen, essentially, over the old building. So this is, a, um, this is in fact, powder-coated steel, and there are about a thousand of those apertures across the facade. <clears throat> A little detail up front. We had some existing problems that we had to work around. We just set the glass behind that. So that was San Francisco, which was open in 2013. And then this is Austin, which we just opened in August. So we're current, we have four stores right now. This is the interior of Austin. And our stores range from about 2,500 in New York to 5,500 in Austin. They just keep getting bigger. And part of that is because our assortment continues to grow over time. We just continue to add pieces into our collection. So we also sell to the trade, uh, to architects and designers. It's a big part of our business. And there's some case studies. This is from our website, uh, Facebook, AOL. And we just published, uh, there was just some, some images published of the Uber headquarters that we did some Uber pieces in. And then another channel is international. About three years ago, we found a partner in Australia <coughs> we launched Blue Dot Australia as a franchise. So there's a store in Sydney. Uh, they also manage Blue Dot AU, and they're looking at space in Melbourne. So it's a way for us to get international distribution without having to go to somewhere overseas, rent space, figure out the labor laws, hire employees, and manage all that. So it's a great uh, it's a great relationship. And in this case, this partner is really good at understanding our business. Uh, a couple years ago, we, we partnered with Target to do what they call in the licensing and branding world a diffusion brand, which is basically a kind of CK to Calvin Klein. It's a it's a lower price point Blue Dot brand. It's called Two by Blue Dot, and we, I guess there's probably let's say there's 20 products <coughs> on, on the site now that we've done, we've done. We we do all the furniture ourselves, and then we just did the the ideas and concepting for some of the accessories that we don't do things like plates. But again, another way for us to get our, our products out into the world is partnering with a major retailer. So 
So at the end of the day, we're now in these hundred independent retailers, our own four stores, our website, uh, to the trade, and uh, international franchisees. So that covers the kind of distribution of getting the product out in the world. And then the last is the brand, which is really important. And we started the business thinking of the brand as a really um, an integral part of our business. And trying to think of a brand, our brand, in the way that we think of a person. Like how can we make a brand that will resonate with someone and will be uh, kind of holistic enough for somebody to say, uh, to describe a in the same way that they can describe uh, a person. Stores. 
So we're trying to keep the pattern uh, close together so that people understand the brand. And then also advertising. So once we could really afford advertising, which it took us a while before we built the business up to the point where we had a budget, we hired a local branding firm, some friends of ours, to do some ads for Dwell Magazine, and at the time, Met Home, which is no longer. Uh, really, I think we just wanted them to get the idea of the brand out, so there's a little bit of humor in here, and then a lot of white space. We thought a white space was, uh, we thought it made us feel confident, so lots of white space. Uh, so this is because it's the Rocky that should put you to sleep, not the chair. Um, this one we got a little bit of trouble for. This says, write the great American novel or source of porn. <laughs> there are a lot of people that have had um, negative impacts in their life because of porn, so don't do this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just, the idea was kind of colliding our furniture with something really random. <laughs> People didn't really understand things. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. It's just seriously serious. There's, there's a lot of these. But, uh, when we first started the company, we didn't have any budget. So we started the company, the three of us scraped together 50 grand, and it turns out we spent most of that money in the first year and a half buying cardboard. Uh, because you can't buy like six sheets of cardboard, you have to buy like a thousand. <laughs> uh, we could buy a custom box. So we spent all the money doing that. We had no money for marketing. Uh, so we relied a lot on free press. At the time, the company was, it was a fairly innovative idea. We were doing things that a lot of people weren't doing in our business. And we got a lot of free press. Um, but eventually that kind of came to an end because the company got older and more mature. And so we tried to come up with other things, continued to come up with innovative ways to attract people. The internet was an obvious place and an inexpensive place for us to do that. So we started doing these kind of viral campaigns. Um, and uh, this was the first one that we did, which was called the swap meet. And it was essentially an online swap meet. And you could offer up what we call creative currency in exchange for our products. So you could say, I will give you a pop, uh, popsicle stick motorcycle that's made out of 8,000 popsicle sticks. If you give me a Paramount sectional sofa. Or I'll give you a one share of Enron stock uh, if you give me a land. So we did an actual negotiate with you. We ended up with about 3,000. Um, but here's a quick little, oh, I'm supposed to do something here. This is just a quick video that our branding agency did to uh, explain to the swapping better than I could. especially during recessionary times when bigger purchases were put on hold. But instead of falling into the trap of discount pricing, we decided to take a different tact and rethought the sales promotional model. A celebration of creative currency, the Blue Dot Swap Meet was a two-week online auction that accepted creative bids in exchange for Blue Dot furniture. An online video starring Harmar Superstar introduced the event and invited the world to bid. Come up with a great offer. Upload it to this website. Pick out any item from the Blue Dot catalog that you would like. If Blue Dot likes your offer, their stylish furniture is yours. Words spread rapidly, and bids started rolling in. And before long, with a little playful back and forth between Blue Dot and their fans, some of the more interesting offers were accepted. A Paramount sectional for a motorcycle sculpture made with 9,000 popsicle sticks? Accepted. A side table for fencing lessons? Done. One valuable share of Enron stock for a lamp? Deal. Bidders were encouraged to gather votes for their bid and campaign to have it accepted, which only spread the word further. Traffic and time on the Blue Dot shopping site increased dramatically throughout the event. In all, 36 very creative swaps were accepted out of a total of 2,000 bids. The project attracted the attention of everyone, from Fast Company to Good to the LA Times, providing over 15 million quality media impressions. And most importantly, Blue Dot got to know a whole new group of aspirational buyers of their furniture, thousands of whom had already shared exactly what they wanted most. And what started off as a one-time effort has now become an annual event. So that's the swap meet. Uh, and then one other, uh, one other viral campaign that we did was called the Real Good Experiment. And it basically was
was to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the store in New York. And we wanted to bring together something that was distinctively New York and something that was, I guess, distinctively uh, in die. And the idea was to put a bunch of real good chairs on the streets of New York and uh, see what would happen. See who would take them, where they would put them, or where they would take them, where they would go. Uh, so it was combining it and getting product, uh, making product available, making design accessible, getting out in the world, and not making it precious. And uh, combine that with something that was New York, which was the site of curb mining, right? The people in New York go out and they walk around the garbage piles, they find things that they take back to their apartment. So it was bringing those two things together, and it was uh, a celebration of the first year of our store in New York. So this is a video of that. What is good? What is goodness? Is it formal design? Is it usefulness? Or is it something abstract? These questions let Blue Dog to embark on an experiment. Perhaps to get a real, honest answer to a simple question. Thank <laughs> you. 
Due to our scientists' extraordinary foresight, we were able to track our chairs via GPS, which, if the aid of modern science, we built and inconspicuously hit on the bottom of all our chairs. We started by looking for how our chips acted, a battery, a bunch of wires, the GPS device. And then we basically took all those parts and packed them together and reassembled it. And then uh, we're sticking it on the bottom of the chair. When someone picks up the chair, they'll activate a tilt switch which will turn on the GPS tracking. So when that happens, the chair will locate satellites and then it will start broadcasting its location to the network. All we need to do to complete our experiment is to travel to the Ingo's house, ring this on her buzzer, and like to ask for an interview.
and I showed some of their artwork, and he said, he said, you know, the thing is that today, every brand is a media company. You can't be a brand today and not be a media company. So I think that's a, a, a pretty good example of that. So, questions? What was that? Where did the name come from? Oh, no, no. So it, it's, it really started because we wanted something that was really simple. It was a graphic mark. We didn't want it to have connotations of something else. So uh, I gave the example earlier in the class I was in about Barbie Parker, which I think is the uh, grandmother's name or something. And it, it has a legacy sound to it. We didn't want something like that. And we liked the idea that it was a graphic mark. And it was about the same time that Prince changed his name to a symbol and became the artist formerly well, known as Prince. And he's from Minneapolis, so it was in our minds at the time that it could be just a with no words, but we couldn't figure out how to answer the phone. <laughs> and we didn't know where to get the phone book, so we ended up putting the blue dot in there. And our graphic designer, who was retired, took away the heat when he designed the logo. But we were doing it for trade, we were building that uh, uh, for the agreement was that he would design the logo, and then we would build the logo for him. So that's how we got our name. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, he was our only option because he was the only person that would take trade. Everybody else wanted the twenty thousand dollars, which he didn't. <laughs> Why have you stayed away from opening a store in Chicago? Uh, you know, it's I guess it's it's uh, looking at every market individually. And right now we have we sell through ID Chicago, which is a store uh, that's based in Chicago. Um, so. What happened, like Austin, for example, we had no retailer there. And we knew we did sales on the web. We knew it was a good market for us. So I guess the short answer is that we just look at every market individually and look at what real estate might be available, what are our sales like, all these different variables. Just looking at each one over time. How does your labor cost going to not fall apart when you assume it? <laughs> You'll have to buy one. <laughs> Well, it basically, I guess the, the easy way to say it is that it's, the back is bent and, and it's captured with the, by the legs. So when you attach the legs, you sandwich the, the seat and the back kind of comes underneath it and the legs are all sandwiched together. So when you lean against it, you're really, if you think of about leaning against a kind of a, a semicircle of cardboard or something, that, and it's, it's anchored at each the front, each side, so it can't, it can't lean back. Unless you don't put it together well, and then it falls apart. How, um, I guess how much, at this point, uh, is your role, I guess how much design do you do versus how much business management do you do? Um, right. And like, is that something that you, I guess, well, first maybe back, like, and then if it is more on business management, is that something that you enjoy? Is that something that you kind of feel like, oh, there's just a little bit of Yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly business management, mm -hmm. right? So I spend, uh, I would, I would say, uh, really doing kind of the heavy lifting and design is probably 10, 15 percent of my time. Uh, you know, I had my own firm here in Chicago for a few years, my own architecture firm. But when I closed it, I went back and looked through all the timesheets and figured out how much time I actually spent doing design work there, and it was about 15 percent. <laughs> so it's not much difference. I mean, I think I to answer your question is I really like. Uh, I tend to, to. Um, I sort of take the challenge of things that I don't know anything about and I like to learn about. So for me it's been fun as the business has grown and we've we had to learn about um, you know, mezzanine financing and supply chain management and uh, gross margin return on investment capital and things like that. That stuff interests me and I like diving into it and so I, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't bother me that I'm not doing design all the time. You know, I gave the example earlier in this class that I had a friend who's an architect in Chicago and he set his firm up so he designs all the time. Uh, he does client pitches, so maybe other than that, he's designing all the time. So he's engineered his practice in a way that works the way he wants it to work. And I guess I've sort of engineered this in a way that allows me to do the things that I want to do. What was the original plan on color for the first time? You know, I don't. I don't know if I remember. I think we want to do something that was light in color. So we have a color that we call uh, risk averse gray. It's kind of a sort of a risk averse gray. <laughs> <laughs>
For you, do you uh, for your design, do you sketch a lot on paper first, or do you go to the cardboard mock-up parts? It's it starts on all all of it starts on paper, and then we usually we go uh, we go into the computer kind of next before we go three dimensional most of the time. It, it really depends. Chairs are something that you really you, you can't make a lot of headway in the computer with a chair, but a coffee table is maybe a different proposition, right? Because the, the it doesn't have to interact with the human body so much. So it, comfort's not an issue, proportion's not as much of an issue. It's really about form. So uh, it just depends on the piece, but I, I like to get into three dimensions as quickly as possible. I actually, so we have four designers that work for us and, and, and three engineers, and um, the designers are younger, and they have a tendency to be in the computer longer, and, and then when they present, they present uh, two-dimensional renderings, right, of the pieces, and, and, and my concern is that if you show a drawing of, a, of what could be a really beautiful piece, <coughs> So there's a tendency to try to kind of, you know, juice it up a little bit and make it a little more interesting in the drawing, which I think is not what it really means in the final product, right? So I try to go, I try to get them to go to the final materials as soon as possible, because then you end up with something that could be just really simple and really beautiful, and that cannot be represented in an eight and a half by eleven on the wall. Um, so I, I guess I just try to get people not to design for eight and a half by eleven presentations and try to get them to really think about what that product's going to be. It seems like a lot of your designs are really uh, driven by the, uh, the properties of the material that you're using. Um, is there ever like a day in the product where you're just like starting from a material you wanted to work with and the kind of product like came up around that? Yeah, I think it's I think that happens a lot. In, in fact, a lot of our briefs, so we start up the design process with a brief that's issued. And the brief may be as specific as the supplier that we're going to use, and it oftentimes has the material. So the buttercup chair started as, we knew it was going to be that plywood. We knew we couldn't afford the tool for injection molding or some of the other more expensive processes. So we knew from the get-go it was going to be that plywood. And then it was designing to that, um, that method of, of fabrication. And going back to that kind of multivariable equation I talked about before, one of those variables is, is is machining, right? It's tooling and fabrication. So you, you kind of you have to know that. You can't solve all the others and then come back and figure that one out later. Um, so I think all those things are we're constantly bouncing across those different variables. But we tend to know the materiality pretty early on. Um, are you thinking about uh, integrating three into your process? Yeah, you know we we use it uh, a little bit. It's we use it more, when we can do it full scale, we do it. So if it's a pull for a cabinet or a, a leg for a sofa, we'll, we'll use it. It's just that it's not ultimately that helpful to have a sofa that's this big. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't get us very far. And, and given the cost, it's, it's usually easier. We model a lot of our sofas in rigid foam. That's the way we make, we model a lot of our sofas. Uh, so we haven't, it, it's not an essential part. People come to our studio right now printer, how do you do any work here? And, and they're shocked actually, you know, they, they don't, they're amazed that we don't have one and, and we just haven't found the need given the, given the expense. You know, Stratasys, which is I think the largest 3D printer manufacturer in the world, is in, in Minneapolis. Uh, so if we wanted one, we, we you know, go down the street and get one, but it just hasn't, it hasn't really come into our process. So you moved from Chicago to Minneapolis to start a uh, design focused like furniture world that's now like a worldwide furniture business. Was that the goal at the beginning or was it just a bit sick of the city and you want a simpler life? Or I don't know, it's like it's really it's pretty inspiring stuff, you know, there's a lot of top location, location, sort of being at the right place at the right times. Right. Uh, well, it was pretty it was predetermined because one of my partners who put up the most amount of money lived in Minneapolis. So that, that was really how the decision was made. Uh, because the, our other partner was in, uh, he was in Arizona practicing architecture. So uh, John said, I want to do it, and I'll put in this amount of money. Are you guys ready? And I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So it wasn't as intentional as you, as you might think.
but it's, I guess I would finish that by saying that it's been, it's been helpful really not to be on the coast because we can kind of do what we want and we're not, uh, we're not in this uh, <coughs> soup with all this other design chatter. We can kind of focus on what we want to do and what we think is good. If we want to access that design chatter, we can go on the internet, we can see what's going on, we can read the blogs, and we can go to the shows. But we can kind of retreat back to where we are and just do our thing. So it's, it's really been, I think, helpful. And there's also a humility to the Midwest that, that, that we think is part of our brand that we wouldn't have if we were based in New York or Amsterdam. Great. Well, thank you very much. Bye.